Good morning, challengers. Is my microphone on? Okay, good. All right. So uh, when uh, Connie called me last Sunday and said, uh, our speaker canceled, could you give us a lesson? I said, sure, why not? What would you like me to talk about? And she said, well, she paused a minute and she said, uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. Why don't you talk about love? Sure, no problem. No problem. I can talk about love, you bet. So I, uh, I have a lot of lessons. I've been teaching a long time. And so I have a lot of lessons. So I went to my file. Uh, it used to be just a big uh, drawer. Now it's all online. But anyway, I went to my uh, lesson file. And yes, I had a lesson on love. And amazingly, I gave this class this lesson in 2008, 15 years ago. And I thought, well, I thought, I said, okay, now there's a lot of new class members, so that's fine, that's no problem. And the old members won't remember anyway. <laughs> so here we are. So we're going to talk about love this morning. So uh, I found this file, and I went back, and I thought, yeah, this works. And, uh, I, and you know, Valentine's coming up, and uh, you ladies, I want to acknowledge, you're all loving. Now, the guys, it's a little more difficult for us. You know, we tend to reach an age when we become grouchy old men. <laughs> so, here we are, so I am more or less speaking to the men, okay? Now, uh, all of us need to love. And uh, when I went back and looked at the lesson, I realized that uh, it is all about becoming more loving. And if you are loving, remaining loving. Now why? So, I wanted to say, if you were here 15 years ago, now, it was really challenging for me because I, uh, I thought, now, Larry, you've, you gave the lesson. Surely you've become more loving in the last 15 years. <laughs> well, I was disappointed. When I thought about it, I'm not sure that I really have. So, have I made any progress in being more loving? Well, I don't know. For all of you who were not here 15 years ago, I'm going to give you a pass on whether or not you've become more loving. Now, that presumes, presumes that you didn't know you were supposed to be loving. That presumes that uh, you didn't know that uh, God meant for us to be loving people. He asked us to be loving people. That presumes that you had never heard 1 Corinthians 13, 13. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Matthew 22, 39, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's one we're going to talk a lot about today. Galatians 5, 6 says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, I first started getting involved in studying love in the Bible when um, I got, I get a upper room. I subscribe to The Upper Room. If you don't know The Upper Room, it's, it's a series of uh, daily devotions written by people like you and I from all over. Here's one from Wisconsin, Ohio, people, uh, South Carolina, Finland, from all over the world. People send in their daily devotions. Here's one from New Brunswick, Canada. So daily devotions that come in, and so you read one every day. Now, if you don't have an upper room, the church has them laying around, and you can just pick one up for free. And so daily devotions. So in 2003, <clears throat> I read a daily devotion 
from the upper room, and it was from Roy. <clears throat> you may remember Roy from that last lesson. Roy was, uh, he wrote in the daily devotion, Roy said he was having trouble with his cellmate. Roy was in prison. Yeah, Roy was in prison. He said, my cellmate is hostile, argumentative, and a troublemaker. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> How can I love anyone like that, Roy asked. His cellmate is hostile, a troublemaker, and Roy is supposed to love him. Roy says, I am with him every day, and he doesn't change. Surely God doesn't expect me to love him. Roy continued, but the Bible is clear that I must love my cellmate, and I work on it every day. I may never change him, but I do know what God expects of me. So the question that I ask myself then when I read it, that I ask you in 2008, can I be as loving as Roy the felon? Now, Roy didn't have a choice. Roy's in prison. He couldn't pick his cellmate. His cellmate was picked for him. He was put in that cell with this guy, and he didn't like the guy, and the guy didn't like him. But they were together, and Roy said, I know I must love this guy. Why? Well, Roy was a professing Christian. Now, I will say to you, when you came here this morning and you sat in this class, you are professing to be a Christian, right? Okay. So Roy says, I'm a professing Christian, so I'm obligated to love my cellmate. Now, we had a lesson here many years ago. I don't know when it was, but we had a lesson on, uh, I had a lesson called uh, Professing Christianity. Who am I fooling? was the title of the lesson. Who am I fooling professing Christianity? So, today I thought, well, this week I thought, have I made any progress in the last 15 years? And then I thought, so what's, the, what's so important about me being a loving man? What's important about it? What is the big deal about being a loving person? So, why is it important? Somebody tell me why it's important. Why do we need to be a loving person? Yes. It is. It's contagious. I like that. Yeah, I like that. What else? If you practice it, then eventually you believe it and you set a good example. You do set a good example. Okay. What else? It makes you healthy. Healthy. Yes, healthy. Okay. It's good for you. Peace of mind. Okay. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Kenny. <laughs> what else? We're oh, we're commanded to love. Thank you, Kim. Yes, we're commanded to love. Yes, we are. Did you know that, that we're commanded to love? Yeah, it's in the Bible. Yes, it is. So, um, I get... In addition to the upper room, I get a daily email from Rick Warren. So every morning I get an email. Uh, Rick Warren is the pastor of the Saddleback Church in California, the founder and the pastor, and also the author of uh, a very popular and famous book, The Purpose Driven Life. Some say that it uh, sells more books, that he sold more books than anything but the, other than the Bible. So anyway, it's a great book. And he said in his book, uh, or in his email that he sends, uh, he said, the most important lesson God wants you to learn on earth is how to love. Hmm. How to love. Now, <laughs> I've already said to a grouchy old man, it is a challenge. Rick Warren says, 
do I really need to be a more loving person? That's the question that I posed this morning. Matthew 22, 37, 39 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second most important is similar. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Rick Warren says, Jesus said two things are more valuable in life than anything else. Loving God and loving others. As Kim said, it is a command. It's not optional. Rick Warren says, have you ever wondered why God just didn't take you to heaven when you, he created you? Why did he put you on earth? You're only here for a hundred years at most. You're going to live for eternity in heaven or hell. Why didn't God just take everybody to heaven? The Bible is very clear that God put you on earth to do two things. To learn to love God and learn to love other people. Life is not about acquisition, accomplishment, or achievement. It's not about the things the world tells you it's about. <clears throat> You're not taking your career to heaven. You're not going to take your car to heaven. You're not going to take your house to heaven. But you are taking your character to heaven. God put you on earth 80 to 100 years to learn to love Him with all your heart and learn to love others. Life is one giant lesson in love. Rick Warren said that. <clears throat> so, love. Love God and our responsibility to love other people. So, it's important. It's a command. Now, how am I doing at it? Well, it's challenging. Like Roy, I have people in my life that I just don't get along with. But I remember <clears throat> as a child, I memorized one verse in the Bible. John 3.16. Who else memorized John 3.16 as a child? So what does it say? We all learned that, didn't we? So as children, we were taught we are to be loving. First thing we memorized, for God so loved the world. So, we don't have many excuses for not being loving. Some of us guys, we thought we were supposed to be tough. And to be tough meant we weren't supposed to love anybody. And it's a hard habit to break. It is a habit, though. But it is a hard habit to break. Uh, 1 John 4.10 says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. So the New Testament talks a lot about love. The Old Testament talks about love. I didn't realize that. Joel 2.13 says, Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. So it's clear, isn't it? Romans 8:38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, as I began this study several years ago, you know, I, had, I, I follow a pattern in my studies. I see what the Bible says, and then I see what other people say about it. And there's a lot of people who have talked about love. Books written about love, uh, just sermons on love. It's a big deal. Love is a big deal. Now, uh, we're going to talk about 
why it's a big deal, and then we're going to talk about perhaps some of the things that we might be able to do. Uh, if Roy the felon can do it, I promise you we can do it. Um, so now, uh, Max Lucado is a minister in San Antonio and a very prolific writer and a very good writer. And he said, just like Jesus, if you think God's love for you would be stronger if your faith were stronger, you are wrong. Don't confuse God's love with the love of people. The love of people often increases with performance and decreases with mistakes. Not so with God's love. He loves you right where you are. So we're talking about God's love of us. So it's different. Why do you think God's love is different? Why am I saying it's different? Why does Lucado say it's different? It's not conditional. It's not conditional. He didn't have to do anything to earn it. Nothing to earn it. Do you hear that? We don't have to do anything. He can even love a grouchy old man, I think. Yeah. What else? Never fails. Never fails. Surely he gets tired of us at times. No? It's different, isn't it? Eternal. Eternal. Oh, good, I like that. Yeah, yeah. You see where I'm going, don't you? Our obligation is to love is growing and growing simply because God loves us. And so our obligation becomes more and more important, doesn't it? Rick Warren says there's three truths about love. Life without love is worthless. Life without love is worthless. We often act like, now this gets really personal, we often act like relations are something to be squeezed into our schedule. We talk about finding time for our children or making time for people in our lives. Now I'm sure this doesn't apply to any of you, but that gives the impression that our relationships are just part of our lives along with many other tasks. Relationships, we treat as tasks. But God says relationships are what our life is all about. Jesus summarized what mattered the most in two statements. Love God and love people. So, I'm hearing three points in all of this. An important point in our life is to love God... So we need to love God uh, because God loves us. Now, I find that to be challenging. Second point, love lasts forever. Now, God intends for us to make love our top priority because he tells us over and over. If you read scripture, he tells us it's about love. And again, for grouchy old men, it's, it's hard. And I, gentlemen, I apologize. Why, why our loving wives find it much easier to love than we do, I don't know. But that's the way we're made. And I think what it says is we're going to be evaluated by how we love. Now, it doesn't mean we won't go to heaven, but there is a judgment even if we get to heaven, and it is going to be about how much we were loving. So, we will not be able to take our career to heaven. We're not going to take our bank account to heaven. But we will be judged by how we treat other people. Yeah. So, I ask you a question. This is a tough one now. Do you really think that God loves you? Personally. Somebody tell me. Yes? yes? Why? Why do you think that? Because he gets me through everything I need to do. Okay, say it again. He gets me through everything. Oh, he does. Okay, he gets me through everything. What else? He's always there. Always there. 
Okay, you know his presence. Yes, okay. He died for us. He did. Christ died for us, for our sins. Mm -hmm. I chose to believe it. I finally oh. to take that step. Yeah. And you chose to believe it. I think we have to make that choice, don't we? We do. What else? God is love. God is love. Have you ever had a prayer answered? Oh, really? I remember a long time ago, our son, uh, who is 60, uh, he was four or five years old. We lived in St. Louis, and he was sick, very sick, and he was in Barnes Hospital, and they diagnosed him with spinal meningitis. And Lee and I were scared to death. I mean, we were frightened beyond fright. And I was not... I was really not a Christian man. I went to church, but I wasn't. But anyway, at a point like that in your life, what are you going to do? Well, you have to pray, don't you? There's nothing else to do but pray. And Lee and I, in that hospital room, got down on our knees and we prayed. And an hour later, they came. Oh, they said, you know, we're going to have to do a spinal tap to confirm uh, spinal meningitis. An hour later, they came back and they said, Oh, good news. He doesn't have spinal meningitis. He's got pneumonia, and he'll be okay in a week. Well, what a great coincidence, right? So, have you had prayers answered? I think we all have at some point. And so, there is a reason to know that God loves us, because He is active in our lives. We are all here today, for some reason, aren't we? To get to better know God and to know what God's all about. So, uh, we evaluate our love based upon what God tells us we are supposed to be and what He is. Uh, Rick Warren says, uh, love will last forever. Uh, love is a legacy. Mother Teresa said, it's not what you do, but how much you love that matters. Not what you do, but how much you love. So guys, it's not how much money we make. It's how much we love. Our lives, for one, at least at that point. So, uh, loving others. So the Bible tells us it's very important, doesn't it? Uh, the Bible says it is a command. So are you feeling a little antsy now? You know, you thought you were going to hear about Valentine's Day and I got you on the hot seat. But no, it's not. It's a joyous thing. It's a fun thing. Loving others really is a fun thing. Even your nasty neighbor. Matthew, uh, I want to read from you, again, just to, to make, first of all, the point from my student Bible. Uh, many years ago, when I first read the Bible, which was only 25 years ago that I started reading the Bible, I asked Lee, I said, I want to read the Bible. And she's got a lot of Bibles, so she laid them all out for me. And I said, oh, I want that one, the student Bible. That's what I need. Give me the student Bible. So Matthew uh, says... Here is Matthew uh, 22, chapter 22, and it says, paragraph heading, the greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. So he's asking Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So, it is a big deal. I ask you to begin with, what's the big deal? Well, clearly, the Bible says it's a big deal. So now, okay, how are we going to do this? We all agree it's a big deal, and we got to be more loving. 
So how do we display our love? Tell me, how do we display our love? A hug? A hug. A friend once told me, he said, you know, my relationship with my wife was very tenuous. It was, it was, we were in trouble. And he said, I learned there were three things I needed to do to improve my relationship. I needed to tell my wife every day that I loved her. I needed to give her a hug several times a day. And I needed to listen to what she was telling me. So there it is, guys. That's all we have to do. <laughs> That's all we have to do. Now, the question is, can you do that with your neighbor? Do you, do you have people in your life that you just can't stand? Do we really have to love them? So what do you think? Larry, you know, I think of the DEIS person we're supposed to have here. Your yeah. Wife. Yes. I'm sure at some point she loved her husband, but yeah. does, does that happen because she doesn't love herself enough? Or she, she loves others more, more than herself? Or, you know, we've got a lot of battered people in this world. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they love others, but they don't love themselves. I mean, there's, we've got the human equation here that sort of messes up this nice love here. It does. Connie. I want to what he's saying, because loving your neighbor as yourself begins with you loving yourself. And so if you're dealing with someone with a mental health issue, they do not have self-care. They do not care for themselves. So you just have to love them and hug them and everything you can. But somehow mm-hmm. you have to constantly tell them love themselves because then I think they will go yeah. outside of themselves and maybe love their neighbor better. So do we not love ourselves? Connie's saying we must learn to love ourselves. Is that a challenge? Apparently it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So we're perhaps too judgmental of ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Kim. A confession. I read it. Okay. Yes, okay. Still in the back of my head, when you're supposed to love these people, you know, push things aside, and you're supposed to love them. And by golly, you know, if they're not doing a good job at it, that, that that's sort of the big yeah. group that, uh, <laughs> can't do but, but anyway, so I, you know, so to some extent, you know, not watching so much news, I know Mark McGrew, he just loves to watch the news, so. Her husband loves the news. Okay. So Ken, it has something to do with grace. Kim's going to do a lesson on grace. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, let's talk about that. What does love mean? What does love actually mean? Passionate love. We can't love our neighbor passionately. Friendly love. Respect. Okay, we can start with respect. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> unconditional, love. 
unconditional. Mm. <laughs> Who loves their dog? Lee loves her dog, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I'm going to love my neighbor. Somehow I'll love that bum. You know, he's okay. There's a love where, um, like, the love will take the injustice. The people can't do what other people can do. Mm. And that's the Yes. Okay. Is that a description of avoiding them? I don't know, but let's say that if someone murders your son, I mean, how do you, uh, you can love and forgive that person, but there's still going to be, and, and, I mean, unless you somehow have, yeah. I mean, there are murderous crimes that you can just get out of jail or something, but usually you don't have any physical. Okay. So I hear forgiving. Yeah. Okay, forgiving is a step. Yes, Sudi. I found out uh, that I can't love unconditionally or love somebody I don't like unless I understand and focus on God's love for me. Ah, okay. Focusing on God's love for me, focusing on your partner's love for you, brings an obligation, doesn't it? And I think two people, sometimes I think it's just got to be an instant turn on loving you, you know, and as you said, uh, the various things, it's hard to, okay, well, back to my example, um, but it's okay if we just start making Faithful, good. Yes? Thank you so much. Separating the person from the behavior helps to be able to say, that person will like either suffering and dying. I would still want to help them even though I'm yes. thinking it up and down their life. Okay. Still we don't know everything about other people. That's right. Yes. Be judgmental. Yeah. Judge, yes. How about just greeting somebody with a smile, even though you know you don't like them? Have you ever tried that? Yeah. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, in the car. She's talking about, she's not talking about her husband, Mark. She's talking about in the car. Okay. Let's get that clear. Okay. Your neighbor. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about the attitude that we approach people with, right? So, uh, so. I find it hard. I see somebody that I don't love, and I turn or avoid. But if I just smile and say hello, what happens? I'm making a step to becoming more loving. You're so helping them too, I'm helping them. Back. Yes, good. Janice says I'm helping them. Yeah, so we are helping with that relationship. Yeah. You know, and nobody likes them, and they just, you just need to kill them with kindness. And I've found that that helps sometimes. Yeah. Mm hmm. <clears throat> okay. It is your attitude that, that's contagious, then, isn't it? Or it helps. Yeah. Mm hmm. Kindness. Hilarious. Yes. There are times, too, when a loving thing to do is to confront someone and discuss and work on the behavior or whatever is going on. Yeah. Uh, that's loving them. It is. Us. Yeah. Difficult as it is, but that is because you cared enough to risk doing that painful thing. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is practicing. We have to practice being loving. We can't just turn it on and say that's it. Click, it's on. We have to practice it. Yes, okay.
Yeah. Getting to know the person helps us love them. Yes. Patient love. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, practice, practice, practice. Loving is a practice, and it takes lots of practice. And patience. Can we be patient with others? It's and it's an important step. So, yes. How do you connect kindness to love? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Kenny says practice kindness is the in and outdoor quick trip. Yeah. Yes, holding the door, good, yeah. Saying hello, greeting with a smile, yeah. It's how we conduct ourselves with strangers, yeah. You know, I've passed through a sermon lately, working with somebody down from, somebody don't know or whatever, and they say, oh, I'm so-and-so, how are you doing? I'll say, I'm so-and-so, how are you doing? Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm You know, a big question that I've always had is like does did God love Hitler? Whoa, did you hear that? Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You love your children, but you don't necessarily love what they do. Did you hear that? You love your children, but you don't necessarily love what they do. Yes, yes. So there are degrees of how we treat it, and, and we're, we're concluding that it's up to us, aren't we? We have, to, we have to make the effort. We have to practice it. We have to say it. We have to uh, think about it. We have to approach people with a sense of, I don't know you, but I love you. So I can give you a smile. I can greet you. And uh, accept what we get back graciously. And uh, we can't give up very easily. So, conclusions. God gives us, God has grace. God gives grace. God gives us grace. He gives us the grace to love others. It is not something that is counter to our being. God loves us and he gave us love. Some of us grouchy old men, we try to surpass it, suppress it. You know, we were taught that you got to be tough. And it's not right. So. We have to recognize that God gave us grace as well. God loves us because he chooses to love us. And we have to make that decision. We have to choose to love other people. We just have to make that decision. Nothing we do, nothing we do can separate us from God's love. Nothing we do will separate us from God's love. Our children, as we just said, things they do we don't like, but we still love them. So, these, I mean, it's a hard concept to grasp, I grant you. But it's clear. The Bible makes it so clear. As professing Christians, it's our obligation. 
For as a grouchy old man, it's my obligation to love, to love all of you and to love others. So we've got to do it. So. I sort of think it is. <laughs> What's it saying over there? Be kind to one another, tender, forgiving to one another, as God, is, as God in Christ forgave you. It's our motto in this class. Read the motto. Okay. God loves others. It is our goal. Now, we're not there, but we're getting there. And he's going to give us the time. I sometimes tell people, you know, I'm ready to go to heaven. I don't want this hurting knee. I don't want this hurting back. It's all going to go. Why do I have to stay? And I say, I think he's going to make me stay till I get it right. <laughs> yes. So, I know my wife needs my love. But she knows I love her. I bought her a new car. Is that the right attitude? No. no. Guys, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. <laughs> I don't care how much it loves. I'm going to love that. How much it hurts. I'm going to love that bum. No, we can't have that attitude. Max Lucado said the power to love. Many tell us to love. Only God gives us the power to do it. We know what God wants us to do. This is what God commands us, that we love each other. But how can we do it? How can we be kind to the vow breakers, to those who are unkind to us? How can we be patient with people who have the warmth of a vulture and the tenderness of a porcupine? <laughs> how can we forgive the money grubbers and the backstabbers? How can we love as God loves? We want to, but how can we? Think about some of the people in your life that you find hard to love. Well, we can do that. It's not easy to love those who have been the source of headaches, abuse, rejection, or loneliness. Some of you wonder, how can you ever love people who've caused pain? So what can we do? Well, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. C.S. Lewis was a Brit, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, an Englishman. And C.S. Lewis, like me, he came to Christ late in his life. Unlike me, C.S. Lewis was a professing atheist. And uh, a brilliant man. And uh, he came to Christ through a friend, J.R. Toklin. And they argued about it all the time. And he logically, C.S. Lewis logically, came to Christ figuring out that it was true. It was right. And he says, love your neighbor does not mean being fond of him or finding him attractive. I, ki I admit that this means loving people who have nothing lovable about them. Perhaps it makes it easier if we remember this is how God loves us. Not that we're nice, not for our nice, attractive qualities we think we have, but just because we are called his children. For really there is nothing else in this, nothing else in us but love. Creatures who actually find hatred a pleasure, that it's like giving up hatred is like giving up wine or tobacco. C.S. Lewis says. So, how do we learn to love? Practice, practice, practice. We got to start and we got to practice. We practice every day. So, three principles. If we profess to be Christians, then we have to love. It's a requirement, it's not an option. Loving the unlovable is not a natural instinct, but God expects us to do it and He commands us to do it. Third, knowing that God loves us and loving others is a big deal, it's very important. A challenge for the challengers. Well, so I leave you with a question. Can you be as lovable as Roy the felon? Yes, you can. All right. Let's close in prayer. Father, we've gathered here this morning to, to, to grow closer to you, to understand better uh, our obligations to love. Help us, give us the strength to be loving, and, and help us uh, be a loving force in your community. I, I lift up to you all who are here this morning and pray that you will keep them safe and in good health throughout this week. And God, help us become the loving, 
patient, kind people that you ask us to be. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. All right. <clears throat> Great job, Larry. Thank you so you much. Bet.